Twitter today. We're here with um, author of Shot Down, the true story of pilot Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth. He's a past president of the 306 Bomb Group uh, Historic Association, and he has also um, been also involved with um, a number of organizations, and his uh, books have been featured at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, National Museum of U.S. Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, also National Museum of the 8th Air Force in Wheeler, Georgia, and just basically just knows a lot about planes and lives the story to tell about the B-17 Susan Ruth. So live, ladies and gentlemen, from sunny California, flying in, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Snyder. Steve, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Well, it's glad to have you on. So you're the author of the book, Shot Down, the true story of pilot Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth. You're also the past president of the 306 um, Bomb Group Historic Association, and you also had your books sold at um, quite a few um, national museums, and you just you know, lived through a very interesting period, and you also um, have been through a memorial, and just a really interesting story on what life is like on the base, and just simply um, you know, talking about the story back in February 8th, 1944, and before we get to all that, um, tell us how I got started. On writing the book? Uh, we'll talk about uh, you first, how you got started as a pilot. Oh, well, I'm not a pilot. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So uh, so go ahead, just uh, tell us how you got started. Yeah, my, my, my dad, uh, after he came back from the war, uh, he never flew again. So I wasn't uh, exposed to aviation, so I didn't become a pilot. But now I'm around uh, warbirds, World War II planes uh, all the time. Well, not this year. Um, but usually I go all around the United States attending air shows, uh, signing copies of my book. And I do a lot of uh, presentations, PowerPoint presentations, at different sorts of organizations. But all that's kind of uh, been uh, canceled this year with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, growing up, I knew the basics of my dad's World War II history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England with the 8th Air Force. And he flew bombing missions over Europe. And on February 8th of 1944, as you mentioned, uh, his plane, the Susan Ruth, uh, he named his plane after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. Uh -huh. uh, and on February 8th of 44, his plane was attacked by two German fighters that were shot down. And uh, two of the crew were killed uh, in the plane. A B-17 had a 10-man crew. The other eight bailed out, and uh, after my dad bailed out, he was missing in action for seven months, but he evaded capture and eventually wow. got back to England. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, but it wasn't until I retired from 2009 that I really had the time to delve into my dad's war history in, in more detail. Um, I, my career was in sales and sales management. I have uh, had no background in, uh, in writing or any training whatsoever. Uh -huh. uh, but I just started doing a lot of research, and three years into my research, I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that people needed to know about it uh, and read about it, so I decided to write a book. That is amazing, too, and of course, it's on Amazon right now. It's a number one bestseller and recipient more than 25 national book awards, and uh, of course, you know, your father was knocked out of the sky by German fighters, and... So, so during that time of seven months that your dad was uh, missing in action, so maybe just a little bit about um, how he managed to survive, what was like, or also what was life like on the base as well as in London and the England countryside as well. Okay, yeah, there. Uh, when I was after I tired, um, I had no intention of writing a book uh, at first. I just wanted to go through all the material that my parents had kept after the war, and they kept a lot of uh, information. And there were two items that were really uh, significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action about his plane being shot down, which is absolutely riveting. And the other was all the letters that my dad wrote to my mother while he was stationed in England before he got shot down. And reading those letters were just, were just fascinating because my dad was very candid in what he wrote in those letters. He wrote about um, what missions, what uh, flying combat missions uh, were like, what life was like on the base, what life was like in England and London at the time, escapades of him and his crew and 
uh, that's how I really got hooked uh, from all those letters that my dad uh, wrote. Uh, that was an interesting time, you know. After Pearl Harbor, uh, the United and uh, on December seventh, nineteen forty-four, the U.S. was at war, and you know all these start, young guys started volunteering, um, and so the. The military was made up of real young guys, uh, citizen soldiers, as they were called. These guys were in their late teens or early twenties, and you know, back then, the U.S. was a lot different. A lot different country. It was very rural back then. Everyone lived out in the country. A lot of these guys hadn't even been out of their hometown or, or county, and all of a sudden, they were halfway around the world fighting the war. <laughs> Here they are, you know, these guys in the Eighth Air Force, you know, they're going from this little, you know, farm town in Iowa or Pennsylvania, wherever they are. And now they're in London, you know, which is, at that time was the uh, most vibrant city in the world. And, you know, they'd never been away from home before, uh, never been away from their family, from their mother. And all of a sudden, they could do anything they wanted to do. You know, they could drink, they could smoke, they could chase women. So it was a very exciting time for these guys before they <laughs> actually got into the thick of uh, the battle. And then, yeah, they had a rude awakening of, of the terror and the horrors of uh, uh, of combat is like. Uh -huh. and, and also, too, like with your dad, um, you know, being in London as well, too. What was his personal description of London and what were his initial thoughts? Like, you know, comparing to the United States and um, lifestyle and... Or, or like you said about the drinking, the pubs and, you know, people, culture, food and and everything like that. Maybe just a brief details about his thoughts on London, you know, comparing to you uh, back home in the United States. Well, you know, England was uh, a lot different, like a lot different from the U.S. Uh, they were much more proper and formal and in and, and how they uh, approach life. And these young uh, G.I.s and airmen, you know, they. They were footloose and fancy free. They were well paid. Um, they had access to cigarettes and nylons and chocolate. So uh, they were a big hit with the English girls back there. Um, my dad was married, uh, had a little baby girl, Susan Ruth. He was a, 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 a dedicated Christian. So, But he said that these guys, they, they could get anything they wanted back then. They were all the British men were off at, you know, fighting in, in the war. And so you had all these uh, U.S. Uh, GIs there and uh, they had a good time with the with the English girls. Uh, London had been bombed. They had gone through the Blitz. Uh, so a lot of it was destroyed of, of, the, of the city. And then at night there were blackouts. And my dad said when he'd go into London, you couldn't see a thing. He would get lost all the time. Because oh, wow. there were no lights whatsoever, but they would find these e pubs or kind of speakeasies that were open uh, after curfew. And uh, it was fun. And it was sightseeing. They saw all these historic places, you know, if they were on leave during the day, like St. Paul's Cathedral and Westminster Abbey and uh, uh, all these places like that. So it was an, an exciting time. Um, and they'd go in to the little towns near the base to the various little pubs. Um, where they go drink and try to uh, forget all the the horrors of flying combat missions. Mm -hmm. That is amazing as well, too. And we'll talk more about the book and um, also maybe a little play-by-play -play on how this all happened. But first, listen with author Steve Snyder, the true story of a pilot, Howard Snyder, and a crew of the B-17 Soothing Root, now available on Amazon here on the Mike Wagner Show. And I noticed you have a picture of it as well, too, on your left shoulder next to a tiki mug you were talking about early as they say in the uh, pre-show. So maybe just um, tell us about the photograph and where your dad's at. Maybe just um, talk a little about the picture and especially the crew. Yeah, I'll show it up. Uh, I guess you can see that okay. Yes, uh, as I, I mentioned, my dad had our, our B-17 had a 10 man crew. They had four officers that are kneeling in front here. My dad was the pilot. Uh, he's kneeling here on, uh, I'm pointing to him. Uh -huh. And uh, he was the first pilot and as such, he was the, uh, the commander of the, the plane and, and the crew. That's why he was able to name the plane. And then I had uh, six enlisted men who were mainly gunners up here. This is their crew picture. Every B-17 crew took a picture in front of a, a B-17. That's not the Susan Ruth. That's just the uh, a plane that they took their crew picture in front of uh, while they were there. 
Mm-hmm. So the, the the book's just not about my dad, but it's about what happened to each member of the crew because something different happened to each guy. Uh-huh. Five of them made it for home, but five of them did not. Mm-hmm. And then it's also about all the uh, courageous Belgian people that risked their lives trying to help them. Mm-hmm. That, that's amazing. And of course, you know, having a shot down Belgian and they came to rescue. And I guess you kind of wonder was, you know, what was like the uh, first impressions of the Belgian people and what was what were they like back in 1944 compared to today? Well, they were uh, amazing uh, people. Uh, they really saved my dad's uh, life. Um, and it was very, very dangerous for the any Belgian person to help uh, downed Allied airmen because uh, Belgium was occupied by the Nazis at that time. So if the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out that they were helping uh, Allied uh, airmen or uh, any of the Allied soldiers, uh, they would be arrested, tortured, and either sent to a concentration camp or shot. And some of the people who did help my dad and other members of his crew did meet that fate. So they were they were wonderful people. Uh, I've been to Belgium six times. Wow. During, during my research, and even today, the Belgian people are still so thankful. Uh, and so grateful for the American soldiers and the allies coming to rescue them from four years of Nazi oppression and not Nazi occupation. Um, and when you talk uh, to the Belgian people back then and so forth, they go, gosh, they're risking their lives. But then they also say, well, those U.S. airmen, they're risking their lives to come liberate us. So the least we can do is try to, you know, help them. Uh, normally when... Uh, Aaron were, were shot down and the underground came across them. They tried to get them back to England through various escape routes uh, down through France, uh, over the Pyrenees into Spain and then out through British control Gibraltar. But something always went wrong trying to get my dad out. They could never get him into these escape routes, either, either because they were compromised, infiltrated by by, you know, German spies or. Uh, some of the people in these escape routes, you know, were killed. And so it was a very dangerous time to be uh, uh, a soldier or an airman shot down in, uh, in an occupied country trying to hide f- and escape uh, the Germans. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, this is all in the seven months as well, too. And you um, you said the book is not just about your dad, but also um, five of the men that survived and five didn't. And maybe you can talk about um, a couple that did survive and a couple that didn't. So you can just, um, you know, go to one at a time and uh, you can... Go, we'll go about um, probably the most amazing story that a person did survive or two or a story that, you know, was amazing, but then that didn't survive. Yes, well, three of the uh, eight who bailed out, they were captured immediately by the Germans and they became prisoners of war. Uh, two of the men, uh, waist gunner Joe Musial and uh, bombardier Richard Daniels, uh, they were injured so severely that they were repatriated back to the U.S. Uh, before the war was over. And then uh, the other uh, member of Dad's crew that was uh, captured and became a POW was Roy Holbert, who was the flight engineer. And he spent the uh, remainder of the war from February 8th until uh, the end of the war in Europe in May of 45. And he had an amazing story. Uh, he was involved in the 86-day Black March, um, which was a, a terrible or, or, ordeal. Uh, my dad evaded capture, and another one of his crewmen, uh, Bill Schlenker, evaded capture. Uh, but they had totally different experiences. Uh, after my dad bailed out, he came down into some trees, and he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and couldn't get down. Oh my for, fortunately for him, a couple of young Belgian men came to his rescue before the Germans got there. Uh, his plane was shot down in the early afternoon. So once they helped him down out of the tree, they told him to stay put and hide because they thought it was too dangerous to try to move him during the daylight with German patrols coming the area. So that night they came back and uh, got him and took him to the Durvan farmhouse. The two Belgian men were Raymond Durvan and Henri Franken. He stayed there one night, and then after that, uh, he was moved from place to place to place. Uh, how long he stayed in any given house, depending on how brave the people were who lived there and how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it was for him to stay there. He might stay one night, he might stay, stay six weeks. 
So he was moved all over the place, as opposed to Bill Schlenker. He stayed the whole time with one woman and her two daughters uh, in, in Chimay and, and, and at their house. So they were totally different uh, circumstances. Oh, my goodness. And of course, um, and, and of course, and Sumi had to learn the Belgian language as well, too. That's what it sounded like. So <laughs> and, and did you pick up any Belgian by any chance from your dad or maybe he taught you a little bit of Belgian? I just want to throw it out there. Well, Belgium's a unique country. It's div- kind of divided in two. The northern half of Belgium is called Flanders, where they speak Dutch. Uh-huh. And, the, and the southern portion of Belgium is called Wallonia, where they speak French. Huh. So, my, so my dad and the plane and the guys that were able to bail out, they came down right at the French-Belgium border. Actually, my dad and the plane came down in Belgium, and the other guys who bailed out came down in France. So they were right at the border. So everyone spoke French around that area. Uh, and of course, when my dad first bailed out, uh, he couldn't speak any French. He had a little French-English dictionary he could refer to. Uh, but one of the places he stayed at for a lengthy period of time, there was a next-door neighbor called Mimi Gabriel. Her name was Mimi Gabriel, who was 16 years old, and she could speak English. And so she would play cards and Monopoly and do crossword puzzles with my dad, and she taught him to speak conversational French. Okay. Um, I, I, I could, shouldn't really say I can. Sp- I took French in uh, in high school, and I know a lot of words, but I really can't uh, speak it very well. <laughs> it, it's perfectly okay. I can know a few, but um, we don't. Uh, <laughs> I think we'll have to do it another time. We'll have to take up some French. We'll have to do this in French as well, too. And <laughs> ho- ho- hopefully, um you know, do this interview in French and maybe some people in Belgium can pick it up. So, and of course, um, 1989, according to shot down the uh, book from Amazon here, the Mike Wagner show, a memorial to the crew of the Susan Ruth was dedicated at Mackinois, Belgium. Did I say it right? M-A-C-Q-U-E? Mackinois. Mackinois. Okay. So and every year it's been held to honor and remember the men and it's, also duty to remember. So that's been going on in 1989. So what would you probably say during that time was a little more emotional than usual, like say 1990 or even 2000 or whenever? Well, like most, most World War II veterans, my dad didn't talk a, a lot about the war until 1989 when that memorial was built. And he and the other three crew members that were living at the time went over for the dedication of the memorial. And there he was reunited with all these Belgian people that hit him during the war, revisited these places where he was hidden, and that brought it all back, and he started talking about it after that. And then five years later, in 1994, I made my first trip to Belgium. My wife and I accompanied my parents to the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and of my dad's plane being shot down, and that's when it became personal for me because I saw these places firsthand and actually met a couple of his helpers at that time. And as I mentioned, since then, I've been to Belgium uh, five times and I've made some lifelong friends there. That is amazing, too. And of course, we'll talk more about the book and uh, maybe some interesting moments as well, too. And um, what's coming out Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17, Susan Ruth here on the Mike Wagner Show. And you're also past president of the 306th Bomb Group Historic Association. And, um, tell us all about that group. Sure. Well, my dad was in the 306 bomb group uh, in the 8th Air Force Station in England at the peak. There were about 40 different bomb groups located uh, uh, in an area called East Anglia, which is about the size of Vermont. And these air bases were located only about five to 10 miles apart. Uh, the 306 was base was at Thurlai, England, which is about 60 miles north of London. Mm-hmm. And uh, I uh, after I retired, I joined the 306 Bomb Group Historical Association, uh, became a member, and then became an, a board uh, member, and then served as uh, president of the association. We have annual meetings, uh, reunions uh, every year at different uh, cities around the country. And it's our mission to remember, honor, and educate, to, re- to remember the air war over Europe, to honor the men who fought it, and to educate the public about it, especially younger generations. You know, World War II uh, ended 75 years ago, and that's a long time ago, and it's kind of uh, fading in people's memories, and it's our mission, and it's my mission, 
it's why I do these air shows and do a lot of public speaking is to uh, keep the memory alive and to educate the public about what these young, brave uh, men went through and the sacrifices they made to uh, ensure that uh, freedom was restored and maintained and that we can enjoy all the freedoms that we have today. You know, there's a lot of younger generations that don't realize, you know, uh, how lucky they are to have the freedom that they are, but it came at a, at a, a high price and a cost. Uh -huh. And also, too, and it get back to the training of the uh, pilots as well, too, how, how much uh, training was required to be a pilot in the um, Air Force back then? Or well, it was uh, pilot training was real, real tough. Uh, there was three stages of pilot training, uh, primary, basic and uh, advanced. And 40 percent of the, the, the men who started pilot training washed out. Um, it was uh, very difficult, you know, both physically and mentally to be a pilot. You had to learn aerodynamics and and uh, physics and meteorology. So there was a lot of uh, book learning to do then. And then, of course, you had to learn and uh, how to fly a plane and uh, be a good pilot. So there was various guys that would flunk out uh, along the way. Uh, my dad went into actually my dad went into the Army to begin with as a result of the first peacetime draft in U.S. history in the fall of 1940. My dad went into the Army in the spring of 1941. He was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. But then he uh, married uh, my mother, Ruth Hempel, and then uh, they had a baby on the way. And he didn't think they could he, he could support him very well on a private's pay in the Army. So he volunteered for the Air Force in 1942 to go through pilot training. And if he could make it through pilot training, become an officer, he'd be making a lot more money and then be able to better uh, support his family. But he graduated from pilot training in April of 1943. Um, and then he went to transitional training where he learned how to fly a four engine B-17 bomber. Then after that, he went to operational crew training down in Texas where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. And then once they were deemed ready, they were assigned overseas to the European Theater of Operations, where they reported to the 306 Bomb Group uh, on October 21st of uh, 1943. Wow, that is something. And, and, and of course, it took a lot of um, courage to um, fly over and everything else. And I, I guess my question is, is that um, if you were to become a pilot, would you be able to um, fly like what your dad did or say with, um, I, I'm trying to how to put this. That, I mean, it's just fascinating. I have to say this, like, you know, could you imagine yourself being a pilot like your dad? Well, I've, you know, been up in uh, little small planes, just me and, and, the, and the pilot. And uh, now I kind of wish I had have learned uh, to fly because uh, it, it is fun. But it's one thing to, to fly just uh, general aviation for fun. And it's a whole another thing, you know, to fly when, you're getting shot at and uh, guys are getting getting killed you know back then those those b uh b17 uh bombers they they were back then you really had to fly the plane you know the, today you have computers that do most of flying and you it took a lot of uh, stamina to fly I mean, you it, had, it took muscle if they flew in tight formations with all these bombers in close proximity to one another so they had to stay alert at all times or else they could clip a wing on the plane next to them or run into the plane in front of them uh, and go down. Also, these combat missions uh, lasted six to 10 hours. So it was very fatiguing, both mentally and physically, to just, just to try to control that plane. So that's why they had two pilots, a first pilot, my dad, and then a co-pilot, so they could trade off flying the plane on these missions uh, so one would could get a little, get a little rest. And then it was uh, the conditions in those planes were, were uh, horrible. Uh, those planes weren't pressurized. So above 10,000 feet, they had to go on oxygen or else they'd pass out and, and soon die. Also, it was extremely cold uh, at the altitude that they flew, again, because the planes weren't pressurized. It was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero in those wow. planes. So frostbite was a huge problem, and there were a lot of airmen who suffered serious frostbite injuries. Uh, one of my dad's waist gunners was in the hospital for two and a half months um, because uh, at, at that altitude. So it, 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 and then, you know, that's before, you know, they even got 
attacked by German aircraft or anti-aircraft fire and, and, and all that. So <laughs> being a, there were 26,000 men in the 8th Air Force who died, which was more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific. Wow. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. There was another 28,000 men who became prisoners of war after their planes were knocked out of the sky. Being a combat crewman in the 8th Air Force during World War II was the most hazardous duty assignment in the United States military. That is amazing. And your dad lived to tell about it. And is there any other highlights you would like to share about um, your, your dad and the crew of the B-17, Susan Ruth? Is there something that we haven't covered as of yet? Well, there are a couple things. Uh, one thing about my dad is that uh, after a while, he got frustrated because, you know, he couldn't get into these escape routes. And uh, it was very strenuous for stressful for him because, you know, after all, his plane was attacked. It's on fire. He has to bail out, comes in a foreign country, has no idea where he is, doesn't know what happened to his other buddies on the crew, can't communicate with the U.S. military. He's being helped by total strangers. Anyone could be a collaborator and turn him over to the Gestapo. And there are several instances that are described in the book of him almost getting discovered. But finally, he got tired of hiding. Word came on that the uh, Allies landed on Normandy on D-Day, June 6 to 44, and he wanted to get back in the fight. Unlike most airmen, uh, he had that year's experience in the infantry, so he knew how to fight on the ground. So he decided to join the French resistance, and he mm -hmm. joined the French resistance. Uh, they were made up of uh, small guerrilla groups, independent guerrilla groups located all across France, and they harassed the Germans. They would attack convoys, uh, sabotage. Uh, railway lines, disrupt communication, assassinate German officers. And he fought with the French resistance uh, for a couple of months, risking his life. Not only could he have been killed in the fighting, uh, but if he had been captured by the Germans, he would have been shot on the spot as a terrorist. Oh, and, uh, so that was unbelievably brave. I don't know how many, I don't think I would have, or I don't know how many other people well, uh, would have risked doing that because he could have just stayed hunkered down and waited for the U.S. troops to, and armies to come up through France after D-Day. But he thought it was his duty to get back in and, and fight for his country. So that took a lot of guts to do that. I was going to say, joining a French resistance like that, would that be considered treason? Well, no, because he was still fighting for the Allies. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, he was still fighting with the Allies, uh, and there's a num number of instances uh, in the book of him uh, of encounters that is the, the, the resistance group, they were called the Mackey, uh, had with, with the Germans that are pretty fascinating. And seven months after his plane was shot down, word came that uh, the U.S. Army or U.S. troops were in a little nearby village of Trelon, France. So he walked into town in the town square, walked up to an army major. Actually, it was element of Patton's third army. Huh, Interesting. And uh, identified himself, and then he got hopped a, a ride on a convoy taking German prisoners to Paris, and then from Paris uh, got back to England. Wow, that is amazing. And then from England onto the United States, and um, was that a smooth sailing one, or, or how much adventure did he have to go through that? Well, no, that was a smooth sailing one. He just went back on a, on, on a ship uh, that... Uh, Air Force had a, a rule then that if you were shot down over occupied territory and helped by the underground, that you couldn't go back and fly combat because they thought that if you were shot down a second time, captured by the Germans and tortured, that you'd give up the identity of the people who helped you the first time you were shot down. The only exception to that that I'm aware of is Chuck Yeager, a fighter pilot who personally met with General Eisenhower and talked him into letting him go back into combat. <laughs> oh, good old Chuck Yeager. He knows yeah. how to get it done. <laughs> and, and could you imagine your dad trying to talk into General Patton? I think they'll have been historic. Well, yeah, he didn't meet Patton, but uh, there was a, you know, this Third Army was a big organization. So he, he was sent back to the States and he became a B 17 uh, flight instructor uh, for the remainder of the war. Oh, interesting. That's a good way to. Um, and the whole battle as well, too. That is fantastic. Once again, author Steve Snyder, the true story of pilot Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth, published, uh, 
You can get on Amazon, the Mike Widener Show. A big thank you for your time. And uh, just a few more things, Steve. Um, I forgot to ask you earlier, who, who, who do you consider your uh, favorite uh, writers and authors as well, too, since um, you went ahead and wrote the book? Oh, gosh. Uh, I never thought of that. <laughs> Um, I, well, I've read a lot of books, uh, especially about, I, I always like to read, um, you know, I, before I, I retired, I'd read a lot of, uh, you know, mystery, uh, crime novels, things like that. Uh, but then I've, since I started my research, I've read book after book after book about World War II and the air war over Europe. Uh, I, I really couldn't say I have, have one favorite, tell you the truth, I Mm -hmm. and, and of course, um, and of course, um, ha have do you know of any movies that have come out like that with the um, the the B seventeen Susan Ruth, or is there any, any stories out there that are that were similar to it? Well, uh, well several things along those lines. Yes, there's a uh, the movie, the, the the Memphis Bell, and the documentary, the Memphis Bell. Oh uh, yes, are two good movies. Uh, War Lover. Uh, starring Steve McQueen is another uh, good uh, eight Air Force movie, and uh, another one, uh, Command. Oh, oh, I forget the exact title of that. But actually, today, the twenty first, National Geographic is having uh, a tribute, uh, a Memorial Day tribute to World War II, and they're showing uh, for like all day and all night. Uh, films and there's one about the Eighth Air Force called uh, "Hero I Th Heroes of the Mighty Eighth Air Force" or something like that. Um, but it's on the National Geographic channel, so I encourage your uh, your listeners to uh, if, if they're listening to this today, uh, the 21st, which they probably won't be, um, they could listen to it there. And then there hasn't been any movie made about the uh, Susan Ruth, although I did recently finish a ten. Uh, a short 13-minute uh, documentary short that I've entered into a number of film festivals, and so far it's been uh, selected by 11, and in the five festivals that it's shown, it's won four awards, so that's that's nice. That is very nice, and what are your upcoming plans for 2020 and beyond? Well, um, like I say, you know, normally I keep real busy traveling all over the place, but with the, the coronavirus, everything's getting canceled this year. Uh, but I, tr I plan to, uh, I'd hope to go some, to some of these film festivals uh, as well, but they're mostly just streaming unless they're later in the year that, that they, uh, maybe I can get to them. But it's just to continue, uh, you know, what I've been doing, uh, uh, speaking and, and going to air shows. I, I, I miss those. You know, one, one last thing uh, I'll mention before uh, we go is the, probably the most exciting thing that happened to me while I was researching the book and, and writing the book is that I found the German Luftwaffe pilot that shot down my dad's plane and interviewed him for the book. Oh my goodness. Isn't that something? <laughs> he must have been willing to talk about it. Sounded interested. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, coincidentally, the gunners of my dad's plane shot him down the same time he shot my dad down. They shot each other down. <laughs> Isn't what a, that something? What a coincidence. How often does that happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How often does that happen? And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war, so he speaks perfect English. <clears throat> and he gave me some wonderful insight that's in the book about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force. And uh, uh, we become friends. He's still alive. He's the only person in the shot down story who's still living. He's 96 years old. Hans Berger is his name. He lives in Munich, Germany. And uh, like I say, we've become friends. That is amazing. And once again, author Steve Snyder, the book called Shot Down, the true story of pilot Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17, Susan Ruth. You can check it on Amazon. Steve, a big thank you for your time. You've been fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. And once again, tell us uh, where you can find the book and um, also your, your website and how can people contact you? Okay. Well, most people get the book on Amazon. Uh, like he stated, but if they want to go to my website, uh, they can order a personally uh, signed autograph book. My website is stevesnyderauthor.com. That's Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, stevesnyderauthor.com. And there's a lot of information on my website. It's just not about my book. 
but there's a, a ton of information about World War II, the Air War over Europe, the Eighth Air Force. There's interviews with veterans, uh, lots of videos, uh, links to to research sites. So if someone's interested in learning more about the Air War over Europe, uh, they can learn it on the, the website. And then uh, you can leave me a, a message on uh, my website or you can uh, email me at steve at steve snyder author dot com and then i'm on linkedin and facebook and uh you know all the all the usual social media sounds great once again steve a big thank you for your time you've been fantastic learned a lot from you looking forward to having you again soon do us a favor keep this up to date looking forward to have you back on sometime in 2020 you've been great well thank you very much it's been my pleasure it's been fun thanks again